in May of 2014, FM Walleyes, in an effort to continue to educate our members and the public about invasive species, hosted Nate Olson, fisheries supervisor for the Detroit Lakes region, and Paula Phelps, an aquaculture and fish health consultant instrumental in the safe harvesting and transporting of bait. We encourage all anglers to understand the value of careful monitoring of fishing and boating practices to ensure the best fisheries possible. Now to introduce Nate and Paula from the Minnesota DNR, here's FM Walleye's President Scott Brewer. All right, guys, welcome to the May FM Walleye meeting. It's a rather light crowd, but we kind of expect that for May. Everybody's out fishing, we hope. We kind of try and get people excited about fishing, and once the season opens, hopefully they're out fishing instead of here. So that's why we don't have meetings for the rest of the summer. Let's get into our meeting. All you guys have heard a lot about zebra mussels. We've been preaching zebra mussel stuff for a long time, uh, especially with the help of Barry Chenard, who is one of the more knowledgeable guys in the area on zebra mussels it's great to have his expertise but every once in a while we need to get some guys with a little more knowledge than what barry has or what we hear on the radio because you never trust what you hear on the radio or in the paper so that's why we got these guys in we got nate olson and paula phelps nate has been here a couple years ago uh, he was invasive species specialist for Fergus falls Something like that. Yeah. You never know how the DNR titles go. Now it, Nate is the uh, he's the supervi fisheries supervisor for the Detroit Lakes fishery. So he got a promotion. That's good. Good job, Nate. <laughs> Means he did good with the zebra mussels. He got he got rid of all the zebra mussels in his territory. Yeah. Okay, maybe he did. <laughs> so we're gonna have Nate come up and talk, and then we're gonna have after that uh, Paula will come up. Paula will come from, all the way from Minneapolis. She's with the DNR in Minneapolis, and she works a lot with bait and invasive species and bait transportation, bait trapping, that kind of stuff. So it should be a really good meeting. So uh, let's give Nate a round of applause. Thanks for Nate. I feel like I should be dancing with all the lights. Um, as Scott mentioned, I was here I don't know, 2010, maybe 2011, something like that. I, I can't remember. Um, and that was mainly probably to talk about zebra mussels in Pelican Lake in Ottertail County. Uh, I've since moved on. Um, I'm now the area fisheries supervisor. Um, but Barry contacted me and he wanted to. I've only been the area fisheries supervisor since last May, so it's it's not been a long time since I've been out of the invasive species stuff. And he just wanted me to give you an update on what are we seeing now that it's been almost five years since we've seen some of these infestations. And so I have just some really quick slides. This is probably the most unscientific presentation I've ever given. A lot of it's just observations or photos. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go through. There's no statistical evaluation. There's no you know, 100% scientific evidence of the stuff that's going on, but I'm just gonna kind of show you some trends and, and hopefully give you an idea of what we're seeing right now. So I don't know, I'm sure everybody's familiar with zebra mussels and kind of their, you know, how they reproduce and everything and the problems that they cause, but I figured I'd go through it really quick. Uh, they are native to Russia. They're fairly small, these aren't huge. You know, they're looking at two inches at the most. Most of them are less than, around an inch or less. Uh, they have these unique bissel threads. This drawing kind of shows the little threads coming off, and that's what they use to attach the hard surfaces. Um, this shopping cart, that's it's kind of hard to see, but that's all zebra mussels that's attached to the shopping cart. Um, just a quick deal on their on their reproduction. The females can harbor about 40,000 eggs. We have some evidence or some research that says it may be as high as a million eggs, but probably on the average you're looking at 40 to 100,000 eggs per female and when you look at a shopping cart that's you know that many zebra mussels if, if half of those are females that's a lot of eggs that in just one year that are coming out from zebra mussels so they can reproduce really fast and get in really high numbers um, their reproduction water temperatures it starts at 54 so if this was a normal year they would be reproducing already but I think our water temps on the lakes are just getting to 50 and a little bit above now 
Um, so in the next couple of weeks, that's when they'll probably start reproducing. But they do reach their maximum reproduction potential at 64 degrees. Um, so that's really their, their most optimum reproduction temperature is 64. Uh, once the zebra mussels reproduce, the small zebra mussel is called a veliger, and this is a, a picture of the veliger here. Um, they float around for about two weeks microscopically. You can't see them with the eye. Um, but eventually as that veliger grows, it gets too heavy and it starts to fall to the bottom, and that's when it starts looking for some piece of hard substrate to attach to. Um, that's when it starts to release its bissel threads, either on a rock or a stick or a dock or something hard where it can attach, and then it just starts feeding on, on small plant matter that's, that's in the lake. Um, <clears throat> so what are the problems with zebra mussels? What are the things that we're concerned with? Well, obviously, as you can see with the shopping cart, these things can get very abundant, and they can attach to people's docks, lifts, and they can cause all sorts of maintenance issues. At the same time, though, they can also block intake pipes, so if you have water treatment facilities, or if you have power plants or something that's pulling water from a river or a lake that's got zebra mussels, then those zebra mussels are gonna be taken into their pipes and eventually will start to clog all their pipes and it costs them millions and millions of dollars to try to keep that stuff clear. Um, so impediments to recreation, they can be abundant on the bottom so it's, they can be very sharp so people need to start wearing shoes and be cognizant of, of the presence of zebra mussels if they're out swimming. Um, and then, what we're really concerned about is, is this ability for them to filter feed. And what they're eating is, is sort of all this little plant matter in the background here on the slide. This big guy here is a zooplankton, and that's basically a microscopic animal. And the zebra mussel is eating all the microscopic plant that's, that's in the water. And the problem is, is it's, like, it's like basically zebra mussels are sort of the cattle that are out grazing on the grass. And and we're like the fish, you know, that, are, that need to eat the cattle. The problem is, is if there's plenty of zebra mussels and if they're eating all of the grass that kind of cuts the food chain right at the bottom, and we're concerned that that will cascade up through the food chain and there won't be very many fish for the big fish, and it's gonna be hard for us to have fish survive in some of these lakes. Now that's the big overarching concern that we have. Um, so far, we really haven't seen any of those effects in lakes in Minnesota yet. So. Um, so let's get local here. Let's try to talk about some examples in, in west central Minnesota. The first one, of course, that you guys are very familiar with is Pelican Lake. Uh, it was first found to have zebra mussels in the fall of 2009. Um, probably there, they were there much longer than that, but our first knowledge of them was fall of 2009. And this map kind of shows where the first one was found. We've looked at uh, several locations around the lake. We only found zebra mussels at about two other locations. And uh, we're there in very low numbers. You know, we stopped some people that were taking boat lifts and docks off the lake, and there was maybe one or two zebra mussels on a boat lift or dock. That was in 2009. Uh, in 2010, if we fast forward one year later, this is a picture that was forwarded to me from somebody that this is all the zebra mussels they scraped off their one dock. So that's just in one year, that's how fast these things reproduce. And if you go again one other year, in 2011, this is a picture of our dock at the at the access on at the east access on Pelican Lake. And so you can see they had another really great year in 2011. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any pictures beyond 2011, but um, sort of the anecdotal evidence that I've received is that the numbers are starting to go down. We don't see this many zebra mussels on boats, docks, and lifts as we did early on in the infestation. Um, Something I have a little more evidence to show you is on Lahamadu over by Alexandria. You're looking at going about, I don't know, 40, 50 miles or so from Pelican Lake. Same thing, this one was discovered before Pelican, the summer of 2009. Um, you know, when we first got the call, we found maybe a few zebra mussels around the lake. However, by fall of that year, we already see that they had a massive amount of reproduction. Anything that we pulled on the lake that was, that, had, that was hard that they could attach to, they were attached to already. So they had a phenomenal year of reproduction in fall of 20, like 2009. If we fast forward to uh, 2010, this is just a picture of some of the buoys in Lahamadu and also in Lake Carlos, which is just downstream of Lahamadu. This is all zebra mussels here, all this dark matter. And uh, this is what uh, a resort owner on uh, actually Lake Carlos had in fall of 2010. All this black is zebra mussels. This is sort of a zoomed up picture. 
So I started to use this as sort of my reference. This was an easy spot. It's right off the highway. I could jump here and, and take pictures every fall to see what's going on. In 2011, this is what it looked like. There's still some fairly good colonization here, but not as abundant on the bottom parts of the dock or the boat lift. And in 2013, this is sort of what we saw. And so really what it looks like is happening is after we get the call that there's eagle mussels present in the lake, it seems like within one or two years, we see we, there's just an astronomical jump in their abundance. However, once they get to there, they start to basically use all the resources that they have. And they start to become not as abundant as you can see here. Plus they get a little bit smaller. They're not growing on average, basically probably because there's so many of them out there that just isn't enough food for them to stay, to maintain normal growth. Now, again, we don't have scuba divers out here counting zebra mussels on the bottom. You know, like Mille Lacs, for example, they actually have transects set up where they're actually counting zebra mussels and measuring them and seeing what's going on. We don't have that on these lakes out here. Uh, we just didn't have the time or the manpower to set that stuff up. So the best we have is really what pictures we can take from one year to the next. And from just talking to homeowners and people that are out on the lake. So this really isn't scientific, but it's just basically my observations of what I've seen working on these two lakes and seeing them through time. Um, however, we do have some pretty good data on water chemistry. And of course, as I talked about before, zebra mussels are filter feeders, so they can filter out the small plant matter that's in the lake. And what happens usually is your water becomes clear. And so these Secchi disc readings um, are basically water clarity readings. You know, a Secchi disc is a black and white disc that's used all over the world to monitor how clear your water is. You just lower the disc down through the water until it disappears and you take how deep that is, um, essentially. So, on this graph, this is through time, this is from 96 um, all the way through 2013, and I have to give big credit to R&B Labs out of Detroit Lakes. There's, uh, this data is from Pelican Lake and the Pelican Group of Lakes Improvement District contracts with R&B Labs to collect these water samples and, and to monitor their, their water chemistry. And this isn't really unusual. There's a number of lakes across Minnesota that send all their water samples to RB Labs to get analyzed. So you, there's a great amount of data on RB Labs website if you're ever interested. But basically, here's this time series through time. The higher you go on the graph, the clearer your water is. Okay, so that's kind of what you're supposed to be looking at. And I just used 2009 as pre-zebra mussel and 2009 after as post-zebra mussel. Okay, this is not doing any, you know, for Paula, this is not doing any real statistical analysis. This is me simply taking the values from pre-zebra mussels and seeing what the average water clarity is, and then post-zebra mussels and seeing what the average water clarity is. And so the biggest thing you'll notice is it's about almost uh, four times clearer, or well, not four times clearer, but four feet clearer now than it was in the past. And the other thing to notice is that they had their clearest reading ever. And they've, they've never seen anything, it's over 34 feet clear. Or 30, the water clarity is over 34 feet. Um, at this one reading back in either early May of 2012 or, or late fall of 2011. And so it looks like that in Pelican Lake the water's clear. And you guys probably maybe know this if you fish it quite a bit. Um, so, when we look at Mahamadu and do the same thing, um, pre-zebra mussel, post-zebra mussel, there it's about, the water's a little bit about two feet clear. But again, it, they had their clearest water, their clearest water reading ever. They've never seen anything higher than 20 foot water clarity, and they, and they got that within the last couple of years. So it looks like water is getting clearer in these lakes. No big surprise, you have a lot of zebra mussels that are filtering the water. Um, and actually, one of the uh, scuba diving companies in the Alexander area started to dive on the chain of lakes again because the water is getting clearer. You can actually go there and dive, which he's never been able to do uh, in the past. Um, another thing we can look at is sort of the algae concentration in the water. So when you look at the water and there's all this filamentous, it looks green. Some people say, oh, it's green. A lot of that is filamentous algae or planktonic algae, and we measure that by measuring chlorophyll A. So we take a water sample, we filter it through this filter, we then put it through uh, 
a number of like a spectrometer and stuff, and it tells you what your concentration of algae is in the water. Now, on this one, if you get high, this is sort of greener water. This is clearer water. So um, it's kind of flip flop from the Secchi disc readings we had before. So again, pre-zebra mussel, the average concentration of algae in Pelican Lake, this is Pelican Lake again, was 5.2. Now the average is 4.2. So one microgram per liter difference. Um, not a big thing, but again, it's showing us that the water is, is getting clear. Now when we look at the same thing on the Hamadou, pre and post, it's much different. You're looking at two micrograms almost per liter difference in algae concentration. So you can also equate chlorophyll A concentration to the productivity of a lake. There's lots of little animals that need to eat algae, and then there's small fish that eat those small animals. See, it just keeps moving up the food chain. So this is sort of where we get worried on if all the zebra mussels are taking the productivity out of the water, what is going to happen to our fish population? Unfortunately, we only done one survey on the Hamadou and Pelican since zebra mussel have been there. And so it's really, the jury's still out of really what's going to happen or if anything's going to happen on these lakes. Are they just going to become clear? Is it going to make it more difficult for people to catch fish because the water's so clear? We don't know. Um, this red line represents, you know, roughly the 2009 time frame. This is walleye data for both lakes, Pelican and Mahamadu, and you can see that there's only one data point that we have so far. And since we only get to these lakes maybe once every three years, it could be 10 or 15 years before we probably have enough data points um, to get an idea of whether or not zebra mussels are affecting our fish populations. So, can't really say much yet for fish populations on these lakes. So, conclusions, I have a lot of question marks because again, this is not, I haven't run this through a statistical program or had someone look at it, um, as we usually do if we really want to get good scientific uh, information, but based on my experience, it seems like these zebra mussel populations are stabilizing, which is, you know, sort of what we expect with any sort of biological organism that invades something. It's going to use all its resources, it's going to become very abundant, but eventually it's going to reach some carrying capacity and there's not going to be any more resources for the thing to use. And it has to, you know, sort of reach some equilibrium. It doesn't mean that every once in a while there may be a large explosion in zebra mussels again. And the zebra mussels are still there. It's just that you're not getting that same uh, year class, hot, large year class of zebra mussels every year that we saw when they first started to invade. Uh, clear water is, it's, it's pretty evident that there's clear water going on in these lakes. Um, I don't know if anybody noticed, but you know, while you're fishing out there, I mean, talking to R&B labs, it seems like they're noticing more filamentous algae that's on the bottom. So I don't know if you're running a bottom bouncer or a jig or something like that, and you're coming up with more of that filamentous green algae on your jig. Um, that's not surprising. That's what they're noticing in the Great Lakes, is that as the water clears, there's more light penetration reaching the bottom, which then allows more of that bottom algae to start to grow. And I don't know. If we can talk about that later if anybody has seen that or noticed that, but that's one thing that they're starting to notice on some of these lakes while they're out there. Uh, again, the fish population effects really can't say much with only one data point. Even the one data point that they showed was within normal range for what they've seen in the past on those lakes for walleye catch data. But we're also going to want to try to keep track of panfish data because uh, with clearer water you do get increased plant growth, you know, so the weeds that are out there can also increase in density. And that actually can be a good thing for some of the panfish. So, you know, one of the things we may be able to see in the future is an increase in panfish as a result of increased habitat for panfish, which means more plants that are out there for them. Um, but unfortunately, that's just going to be something we're going to have to keep monitoring and see what happens over time. Um, that's all I had. I wanted to try to leave as much time for Paula and for questions. Um, I don't know if you want to. Do questions now or or wait? Yes. The thing with Lake Erie is that, but they've also seen a large decline in their whitefish populations. 
And the reason is because the whitefish rely on this, uh, all this, it's sort of a freshwater shrimp kind of looking thing. And that freshwater shrimp relies on the zooplankton. And so for the white, they actually have seen declines in their whitefish. It just hasn't equated too much to the, to the walleyes. More than likely the walleyes are able to switch to other prey fish. And that's why we're so, we're so leery to say this is what's going to happen because we really don't know. I mean, even Mille Lacs now where they're having so many issues, all they can say is that zebra mussels might be one of the main reasons the walleye population is in the tank. But there's so many other confounding factors there that they can't, they can't single-handedly point to zebra mussels as being the main, the main problem. Yes? My understanding is that the fish population, the fish assemblage is way different in Russia and those, in those lakes. And there's a lot more bottom feeding fish. They're still relatively abundant, but they just don't cause the issues. But there's a lot of bottom feeding fish that take advantage of the zebra mussels and sort of keep them in turn. And those are fish that obviously, you know, we would like to see more suckers or more carp or that type of species in our lake. So that's my understanding. And back. We recommend 140 or above. I mean, the deal is is that when you get to an adult zebra mussel, the large one that's got a fully formed shell, then you need to be hitting them with at least 140 degree or higher. But if you are just trying to target killing the villagers, then you can kill them with 90 degree temperature water. So when our inspectors, when our decon staff are out there, they're shooting 140 degree and higher water because they just want to, they want to get the whole gamut of invasive species. Um, you know, my recommendation is if you can't get to that hot of water and you've just been in the water for just the day, you know, you're just fishing for the day and you're coming out and you want to flush your live well, just try to get to 90 or 100 degree water and flush it through there because you're really targeting the villagers. You're not, you haven't been in the water long enough to get a fully adult zebra mussel attached to your boat. The only way you might have those in your boat is if you pick them up on an anchor. I'm sure you guys have probably seen this if you've been on Pelican. If you throw an anchor out there and plants or whatever and pull it up, there's going to be zebra mussels all over the plants, there's zebra mussels on the sticks, there's zebra mussels on the rocks. That's when you're going to want to be really careful that you're not bringing those things into your, into your boat. Is there any fish that feed on these things? Or they got any enemies? Um, Native fish to Minnesota, freshwater drum, have the ability to actually crush them. Um, the uh, uh, pumpkin seeds also will pick them up. The problem is, is that the fish has to have the right set of teeth in the back of its mouth to be able to crush zebra mussels. So there's a few. Lake sturgeon can do it, um, but usually we don't. There's so many zebra mussels that we just don't have enough fish out there eating on them um, to keep them in check. Any other questions? Oh. Yep. Yep. That would just be depending on the year. You know, if let's say you had um, a year where it was really dry and there was no runoff or anything in the lake, um, that could be the possibility. Uh, there's it's just a, a myriad of factors. If it was fairly cold and you just didn't even have that algae bloom at the time you're out there doing the psyche disc reading, um, that could be another factor. And that's why I really caution people on, uh, you know, I, I, I would think that if I, if I ran some statistics, I'd probably find a difference, but um, I just didn't have time to do it. Most of the time, like if we're looking at fish data or anything like that, we always look at what are we seeing now versus have we seen that in the past? And obviously, you know, if you have these readings here, I mean, there's sort of a trend line like this, um, but overall, it's if you compared it all the way across time, it probably isn't very dramatic. Um, but this one is quite a bit different. They've never seen that in the, in the past at all. So it really, it's just sort of trend data that we're looking at too. Yep. The fact that hot water is so handy, we were told that Clorox works. <coughs> Clorox does work, it's just that there's, you need a certain amount of Clorox for a certain amount of time. So, um, again, if, for the villagers, they're very sensitive, they don't have shells. 
you know, the contact time is very short for them, but if you're trying to kill an adult zebra mussel that's got a fully formed shell, it can sense the Clorox and it'll just close. So unless you keep it, you know, flowing through your live well systems or your pipes or whatever long enough, then you, you won't kill the, the large adults. Um, plus the other issue that we've seen is that it's just very corrosive to pipes and everything. So if you're continually using it, then you may see some breakdown of the rubber and everything else that you've got for your interior plumbing. And so that's why we've always said, you know, hot water is the safest thing that we can recommend. Plus there's, you can flush that anywhere you want and there's no regulations on it or anything, so. We have been working with the manufacturers on, you think it would be easier, but I, you know, it's all about how fast can they probably pump out a live well frame and, you know, but some boats are really good. They've just got a straight standpipe that goes right down to the bottom of the boat instead of going all the way through to the back of the transit. Um, I love it when we saw those boats. I'm like, this is great, you know, we'll be done with you in no time. Even on my yeah. own. You have a circulation system, you get 20 feet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, I used to, used to go out and, and like, on Parma one year, they have 43 fish per pack. Yep, yep. You still do that? Oh, yes. That's a big part of our of our fisheries program. Actually, Big Cormorant is up to be surveyed again this summer. We do Cormorant every three years. Have you post them? Yeah, we'll, we'll get the results up. The surveys we did last year just went online this week. And what's the website for that? Uh, you can go to Lake Finder. Have Lake you ever done? Yeah, have you done Lake Finder before? Okay, I'll have to, uh, I don't know if they got Wi-Fi in here, but I could walk you through it. Um, Oh yeah, I can show you on my cell phone too. Catch me afterwards, I'll show you how to do it. Okay. That might be a good tutorial for another meeting. Because <laughs> there's a lot of info on Lake, and they've revamped the whole Lake Finder website, so it looks way different now. But, but you can also just call our office too, and we'll give you the report. Even we'll give you the preliminary data once we're done with it, if you really want it that early. It just won't have any fish ages or anything on it, so. Yes? We have had significant pressure from all sorts of groups and entities that you got to shut down the public access. You got to, you know, the problem is, is that that's not the only place where stuff gets moved. You know, we had the Rose Lake incident over there where the, that was a boat lift that didn't even touch a public access. It came through private property and onto Rose Lake on private property. It never even hit a public access at all. And so if you really wanted to get serious about it, you would say, okay, if you don't want zebra mussels, or if you really want to stop it, we're stripping everybody, all riparian owners of their rights. If they want to go boating or fishing or swimming, they've got to come through this access point like everybody else and get inspected like everybody else. Because, you know, there's everybody's got riparian ownership, so they can pull anything through their property that they want to, as long as they can get it down to the water. You know, so in our the public access thing is, we fought that hard, and I've, I don't think there'll ever be a day that we'll shut it down. The, the hard part is we bought a lot of those access places with federal dollars, and if we were to close it down, then we would have to either give it back to the feds, uh, pay it back some of their money. There's a lot of regulations that go along with, with the money that we got from the federal government for the excise tax on that. So, so no, I mean, there's we battle a lot of people that want to see the public access is closed down. You guys want to hear Paula? Yeah, okay, all right. I can answer more questions later too if when it comes up. Yeah, if you guys think of anything else, they'll do a, we'll do more question and answer at the end. So thanks everyone for having me come speak to you today. I'm gonna just follow up Nathan's presentation with a little bit more AIS and um, I was asked to come talk to you guys today about how people can harvest minnows in designated infested waters and what controls are in place to prevent the spread of AIS when they're doing that. So I um, failed to introduce myself. I'm Paula Phelps. I'm the Aquaculture and Fish Health Consultant for the DNR. Um, again, with the DNR titles, that can be somewhat confusing. Essentially, I work with people who have commercial licenses 
So it'd be uh, minnow dealers, private aquaculture, fish packers, and then um, with fish health policy for the state. Paul, can you talk a little bit louder so all the guys in the back can hear you? Can you hear me now? Just scream at them. <laughs> <laughs> they like you. <laughs> okay. So just a quick overview of minnow harvest in general. Uh, there's sort of two types. There's what you can do under your angling license. It's for personal use only. There is no possession limit, so you can harvest as many as you want. However, there's a transportation limit of 12 dozen at a time. So you could transport 12 dozen to your home as many times as you want. You could be holding them in a tank there, have as many as you want, but you can only transport 12 dozen at a time. It says 24 dozen. 24 dozen. It should be 12 dozen. Sorry for the typo. <laughs> I put this together today. <laughs> okay, so um, if you're not harvesting for personal use, you need a commercial license. That license is called a minnow dealer license. Under your minnow dealer license, you can harvest for use personally or for sale, either retail or wholesale. Again, there's no possession limit, and in this case, there's no transportation limit. In general, if you have or you can harvest minnows pretty much anywhere where you have got legal access, there's a few exceptions to that. One of those exception, exceptions is designated infested waters. Um, how can you tell if a water body is a designated infested water? There's a few different ways. The best way is to go on the DNR web sorry, go on the DNR website listed right here and look at the list of designated infested waters. This is always up to date. Um, aside from that, there's two other ways. There would be checking the fishing regulation booklet, which is actually my preferred method because it lists the water body and then the species that it's infested with, whereas the online list is sorted by the type of infestation. So a water body could have multiple infestations, so it would show up under multiple different lists online, so it can be somewhat confusing. So you may want to even cross-reference if you just want to be sure. However, um, in general, infested waters also will have a sign at the boat access that looks either like this or like this, so that will also help tip you off that there might be an infestation there and you would need to take extra precautions. Okay, so if you are an angler who's harvesting animals for personal use and you want to harvest in designated infested waters, generally you can't because of Minnesota statute section 84D.03 says that you can't take um, bait from infested waters except these two exceptions. If a water body is infested solely with Eurasian water milfoil, you can harvest there. I think the thinking behind that is that you can see the plant material and pick it off and you're not going to be moving it. And it is also not legal to transport aquatic vegetation, so those two support each other. Okay, the other exception just came into play last year, and this is a very picky one, so I put out all the wording here. <laughs> okay, so there's four species bullheads, moon eyes, suckers, and sheep's heads, which are also freshwater drum, um, can be taken from designated infested streams and rivers only by hook and line, only for use in that same water body on that same trip. And if you, t if you kill them, you can't bring them home and use them somewhere else. So it's very specific. Um, this was kind of a niche regulation put into effect for catfish anglers, but it may also help other people or Okay, so there's a whole other group of people, and most people don't harvest their own bait. They buy it from a bait shop, so it was harvested by a minnow dealer, unless it was raised in an aquatic farm, but in general, most bait in the state comes from lakes and rivers around the state and is harvested by minnow dealers. Okay, so again, harvest in designated infested waters is prohibited, except commercial people can get a permit. Okay, there's a whole bunch of stuff that applies to getting one of these permits. In order to even apply, you have to have a valid minnow dealer license, which means you have an angling license to start with to be able to have a minnow dealer license. You have to apply for the permit by March 1st. You have to take aquatic invasive species training each year. 
Um, we make people show up and take it in person once every three years, and, and the years that they're not taking it in person, they take it online. Um, and every single year, regardless of if it's in person or online, you have to pass an exam that demonstrates that you have knowledge of AIS and you understand what the risks of working in infested waters are and the precautions that you can take to mitigate the potential spread of AIS. Once you get your permit, you need to read and follow all permit conditions and you have to essentially have a separate set of gear and equipment that you use in each, each different type of water that you work in. So, for example, if I were a minnow dealer and I work in uninfested waters and zebra mussel infested waters and flowering rush infested waters, I need three sets of gear and equipment that's dedicated to those three different types of waters. And each of those, type, each of those sets is gonna be tagged to keep them identifiable. In addition, all of my employees, who are also going to be working in designated infested waters, have to, um, they have to have a valid angling license to be able to be an employee and take minnows. And then um, they also have to take that online AIS training each year, and they also have to pass that exam each year. So I mentioned the tagging process. This is what the tags look like. There are three different colors, blue, orange, and red. The blue tags are for um, harvest in faucet snail infested waters. The red tags are for harvest in zebra mussel infested waters. And the orange tags are for harvest in spiny water flea, flowering rush, and Eurasian water milfoil infested waters. And the permit will specify which of those types of waters it's for. And you'll notice that each um, tag has a specific number on it. Each tag, um, so the number isn't specific to the color, it's specific to the tag itself. So if you've got a faucet snail permit, an Eurasian water milfoil permit, and a spiny water flea permit, and both those two are orange, you'll be able to tell specifically which orange tags go with the Eurasian water milfoil permit, and specifically which tags go with the spiny water flea permit because they'll have different numbers that are noted on the permit. And if you're working in a water body that has more than one type of infestation, you might need more than one tag. So for example, Mille Lacs has um, Eurasian water milfoil and spiny water flea and zebra mussels. So if you're working in that water body, your gear and equipment will be tagged with both orange and red equipment, both orange and red tags. And this is just a picture of some tagged equipment. So these waters are faucet snail and zebra mussel infested waters. Okay, so you've got a permit. If you have a permit to work in faucet snail, Eurasian water milfoil, or flowering rush infested waters, you can work continuously year round. There are no seasons. Um, if you work in a spiny water flea water, there are seasonal movement restrictions, but there aren't closed harvest dates. And if you work in zebra mussel infested waters, there's actually dates when you can't harvest because we feel that the risk is just too high. So that's the date when villagers are present in the water. Just essentially like Nathan pointed out, they're a microscopic life stage, you can't see them. So it's just riskier that you're gonna accidentally move them. So I'm just kind of showing you here, this is off of a spiny water flea permit. This is um, what the seasons look like. And then you can see here, these are the restrictions that we've put in place. Um, containment zone during the summer, early fall season. So essentially we don't let those minnows that were harvested from spiny water flea infested waters be transported out of that zone during that season. Um, that has to do with the spiny water flea can actually live in, or can be passed through the gut of the minnow and still survive. So essentially trying to keep it in that watershed. And then um, we also say that minnows sold below that line have to be held for 48 hours in holding tanks prior to sale. And that is because, like I just mentioned, the spiny water flea can actually survive. So it's 48 hours to let that get out of the minnows system. And then the minnows 
should be posing a risk once they're sold beyond that. Okay, zebra mussels. This is the closed season. Um, during the summer, May 16th to October 15th, no harvest is allowed. These dates are uh, based on just an average of yearly water temperatures. I want to say it's like 55 degrees. Is that right? When villagers start being present in the water body in the quantity that we think is riskiest. So, blacks, it's just slightly different. They get one more week, and that's just because it's further south, it's warmer because it's shallower, so a little bit difference there. Um, this can be variable. We've changed it for people. Like last year, um, it was a really cold year. The ice wasn't even off the water by this date, so we pushed these dates back for people in situations like that. Okay, so in addition to everything else I've already covered, here's the most fun part of the night, permit conditions. Um, so to get your permit and on the back, there's a list of like 20 different conditions that you have to follow. So these are like the controls to make sure that you're not gonna spread AIS. So many of these are already regulations, but we kind of just put them in writing there because not everybody reviews the state revisor website or reads the fishing regulations, so we want to make sure people know. Can't transport prohibited invasive species. So essentially, if there's a zebra mussel stuck to your stuff, pick it off. If there's plants stuck to your stuff, pick it off. This is just, again, um, your, your stuff's um, marked with infested waters tags. Um, so that stuff that you're using in infested waters can't be transported to uninfested waters and vice versa. Very wordy, but that's what it says. <laughs> okay, so when you're transporting your gear and equipment, you can't transport multiple types at the same time, and that has to do with potential contamination. So you can't take um, stuff that you're using in uninfested waters and have it in the back of your truck touching your stuff that you're using in infested waters. This one we had to put in place because somebody was doing it. You can't boat or walk to infested waters through non-infested waters because they've got their equipment that they're using in infested waters and obviously it's a potential source of contamination. Um, Water from infested waters can't be used to transport live minnows, so that means like you couldn't go to the lake that's infested, fill up your tank that you're going to be transporting your minnows in with infested water and then drive off and move that infested water. Water used to transport minnows harvested from designated infested waters can't be emptied into tanks at the permittees facility or any rearing or holding ponds. So this is They've got clean water, they've got the minnows from infested waters and dumped them into the clean water. They still can't empty that tank, um, empty that water into tanks or rearing ponds or holding ponds. Um, and then we tell them how they should get rid of it. It should be disposed of at least 300 feet from natural waters or artificial ponds. So that's basically letting it, letting it just go down into the ground rather than run off and contaminate other waters. Um, we say 120 degrees here, but this is essentially how we ask people to disinfect their tanks after they're done harvesting before they go out again. And then um, this one is specific to zebra mussels, so it'll only show up on zebra mussel permits, whereas the other ones are um, going to show up on all the types of permits. We do not let people use traps in zebra mussel waters, and that's because we don't want people using things that are going to be left in the water overnight because zebra mussels will attach to it. So essentially, you want to make sure that the zebra mussels aren't attaching to anything. And these two are also general conditions. Um, soles and foot portions of waders need to be cleaned with a brush before they leave the harvest site. And finally, we don't let people remove infested water tags during the year. So that's essentially to prevent, like, say I'm a minnow dealer and I've got a permit to harvest in Lacks, and I really only have one set of gear and equipment, 
So we don't want me to use my gear and equipment in Mille Lacs, go home, snip the tags, get in my truck, drive to what's an uninfested water? Ottertail. Ottertail <laughs> Lake and harvest with my infested gear and equipment. So don't want to spread the infestation. Okay. So that covers kind of the whole process of minnow harvest and the controls that we have in place to prevent spread of AIS for people who are working in infested waters. I'll give you guys a chance to ask questions in just a minute here. Um, for that, I have a little kind of plug. <laughs> so um, I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, we have that little niche regulation for the catfish anglers. We get requests all the time from people to put niche regulations into place and uh, last year we got several and we decided rather than try to work these little niche regulations in, it made more sense to take a holistic approach and look at bait harvest and infested waters as a whole rather than this area of the state, <coughs> this area of the state, this specific angling group, what works for them. So um, over the course of this next year, we're gonna be reviewing um, all the regulations, the policies and the permit conditions that apply to bait harvest and infested waters. And we're gonna be looking to see, can we simplify anything? Are there areas where things need to be more stringent? Or are there areas where we could relax regulations because there's already other controls in place that make it so that that particular regulation or permit condition really doesn't make sense and it's repetitive. So um, there are anglers who do harvest their own bait and we want their perspective. Um, unfortunately, because anglers can harvest under an angling license and don't need anything in addition to that, we have no idea which anglers harvest their own bait, whereas commercial minnow dealers have a commercial license so we know who's out there for that group. So it's easy to contact them and say, Hey, do you want to be part of this? But, um, so just a plug, if you're an angler, you harvest your own bait, you think you might have something to add, I'd be more than happy to take down your contact information and have you be considered as being a part of the um, process. We're gonna have sort of three different levels of participation. There'll be a core group, that's people who actually come to meetings and talk and give their input. There will be an advisory group. That's people who give input but don't actually come to meetings. And then there's a group of people who just want to be um, aware of what's going on. So if you just want to be kept in the loop, that's an option too. So if anyone's interested, come see me. Really appreciate any input we can get. And um, if you don't want to talk to me today, here's two other ways that you can indicate interest. Any questions I can answer today? Got it, no one. I'll maybe. <laughs> no questions, though. No. 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 I see, let's say I seen the nose on cottonwood. Okay. Non infested Okay. I go over to Pelican, catch a bunch of water. Do I have to dispose of my minnows when I leave the lake? You just need to change out the water in your bait bucket. <coughs> So what you should do is bring some water with you when you come fit to the... But in July, yeah. that water is sitting in the pickup truck. Yep. Can you keep it in a cooler? Yeah. That'd be the best thing you can do. Yeah, and then of course bring an aerator. Anything else? Overall, are fishermen pretty good at doing you mean switching out the water yeah, before they leave? The they well, I personally don't know. Um, that'd be an enforcement question. They, they don't share that beyond enforcement, so I unfortunately can't tell you. I'm sure there is probably non-compliance, but I couldn't tell you what level. After seeing all the hoops that uh, the bait dealers have to go through as to why Red Hills cost us $16 a dozen or whatever the heck they are now, 
and why you can't buy spot tail shiners anymore because they're so hard to find, you know, because there aren't that many guys out doing it anymore. They don't want to jump through all those hoops. But, and maybe this new task force will help alleviate some of those issues where to make it a little more reasonable for people that want to try and trap bait to make it a little easier for them. All right. So uh, let's give these guys a round of applause. Thank you very much for coming out. It's a souvenir for your trip to Fargo. We appreciate it very much.